Good morning, folks. It is our joy to open the arms of our church, if not the doors of our church, to you who come to worship in the name of the Lord. You notice that I'm wearing a mask, as many people are doing in these days, and I know that you are probably very jealous of the fact that I have one that's covered with tractors. Now, if you're a student of tractors, you will see that there's an Oliver and a Minneapolis Moline and an International Harvester and a oil pull and probably a Ferguson Ford. So I uh, am very proud to be the owner of such a mask. Our clocks were turned ahead on March the 8th, and it seemed that spring was about to happen. But the world has become a very confusing place because of the coronavirus. Whatever happened to Teacher's Sunday and Palm Sunday and Monday, Thursday and Easter and Mother's Day, we observed them, we had special services, but somehow an important something was missing. Last Saturday, as I bicycled from church here back to Penn Yan, after we had recorded Sunday's service, I passed several of the Hopewell Fire Department trucks and several cars that were parked out on a country road. Having been a fireman for over 30 years and being curious, I inquired about what they were doing. It turned out that they were about to do a drive-by birthday party for a five-year-old boy. An ordinary birthday party, now canceled by the virus, had become something special because neighbors and friends made it happen. It dawned on me that even within the boundaries of restrictive regimens, our ministry can make something very special happen. This week, we remember our valiant heroes who laid down their lives in a noble cause. Let us do what we can to make it a special time. Our call to worship is found in 2 Samuel, 22nd chapter, the first seven verses. David sang to the Lord. The words of his song, when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul, he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my Savior. From violent men you save me. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. The waves of death swirled about me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me, the cords of the grave coiled round about me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called out to my God from his temple. He heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. Our spotlight hymn for today is Eternal Father Strong to Save. It was written in 1860 by an English pastor and teacher in order to quell one of the student's fears who was about to embark on a ship to America from England. The words were inspired by Psalm 107, 23 through 26. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in the great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven, they go down into the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. 
The hymn tune is Melita. It is an old word for the island of Malta, where the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked. Originally known as the Navy Hymn, verses were added to honor other branches of service until now there are 21 verses. There is even a verse acknowledging the possibility of space travel. This powerful hymn has been sung at the funeral of several presidents and notable persons. More recently, it was sung in the services for John McCain and George H.W. Bush. Eternal Father, strong to prayer, Lord of courage and strength, we turn to you in our times of weakness and need, seeking your healing power. When our faith is shaken, grant us your assurance. Teach us from your word so that our feet might stand securely upon the rock of Jesus' teaching. Let us grow stronger and deeper in our faith so that we may be a beacon to, of light to all of those who would follow in your way. We give thanks for those who have been warriors in the cause of true freedom. Let us treasure their continuing gift to us. Be ever more present to us as we offer the prayer which Jesus has taught, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our words of assurance come from the second book of Chronicles, chapter seven, 
verse 11. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there are, there's no rain and command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague upon my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear them from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. May the Lord grant us the blessing of understanding as we perceive his truths in these words. Our first scripture reading for this morning is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Today's children's time is called God's Armor. And it follows the scripture that we have just read. Paul was very concerned for the people of Christ who were going to be out into the world and front runners for the kingdom of God. It is like an army facing a scary enemy. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my wife's father. His name was Steve, but a lot of people just called him Schaff. He was a soldier in World War II. He was honored for serving in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. He received a Conspicuous Service Award 
a Good Conduct Medal, a Combat Infantry Badge, a Purple Heart, and a World War II Victory Medal. In other words, he was a good soldier. I wanted to show you something else that was special. He carried a book of prayers with him. While the book is mostly worn away, there is a steel cover on the book that might have given him some measure of protection and comfort in his long hours of combat. I looked closely at the cover of the book, and the steel cover says, May God be with you. Jesus told a story about how things will be when God's kingdom becomes a reality. Those who honored God and used their gifts well will hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We too would like to hear the Lord say that to us. Therefore, it is valuable for us to learn lessons from those who have gone before and those who have earned their honor through their service. We like today to be a special day, and so I encourage the children to remember their grandparents, and if they are veterans, that's fine, but those who have gone before to prepare a place and prepare the way for freedom to be in our land, but more so prepare the place and the way for the kingdom of God to be in this place. Our second scripture is from John 16, 19 through 24. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. On the front of our communion table, there are words in remembrance of me. It is a shortened form of the text from Luke chapter 22, verse 19, which Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. We pass over these words sometimes too quickly, and therefore we are in danger of missing the importance and significance of these words. Jesus wanted this to be a very special event, and he framed it with these words, I have waited and wanted so much to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall never eat it again until it is given its full meaning in the kingdom of God. He wanted these moments with his disciples to have a rich, eternal quality. When we look back at the world in which Jesus lived, we see that the Greek language had two words for time. There was the ongoing flow of minutes that went on forever into the past and into the future. Every one of these minutes was alike. Nothing was special about any one of them. These made up what was called chronos. We get our words chronology and chronometer and chronicle 
from this Greek word. But every so often, something special happens. In the flow of regular minutes, something unique and powerful happens that affects the normal flow of time. These are called points of kairos. They intrude on the regular time. They disrupt, redirect, and give special meaning to that time. In a way, the kairos time was outside of time. Jesus wanted his followers, that would be us, to become sensitive to this special quality that surprises us when we can open ourselves to it. I'm sure that one of the factors in our lives is that chirotic moments have pressed upon us, forming our memories, something that we share together, sometimes something that we have by ourselves as individual treasures, something that just marked a moment as being special. Larry Phillips, a writer of Christian magazine articles, tells about a chirotic moment in his life. He said, Last week I took my children to a restaurant. My six-year-old son asked if he could say the grace. As we bowed our heads, he said, God is good, God is great, now we thank you for this food, and I would even thank you more if mom buys us ice cream for dessert. And liberty and justice for all, amen. Along with the laughter from the other customers nearby, I heard a woman remark, that's what's wrong with this country. Kids today don't even know how to pray. Asking God for ice cream, why, I never. Hearing this, my son burst into tears and asked, did I do it wrong? Is God mad at me? As I held him, I assured him that he had done a terrific job and God was certainly not mad at him. An elderly gentleman approached the table. He winked at my son and said, I happen to know that God thought that was a great prayer. Really? My son asked. Cross my heart. Then in a theatrical whisper, he added, indicating the woman whose remark had started this whole event, too bad she never asked God for ice cream. A little ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. Naturally, I bought my kids ice cream at the end of the meal. My son stared at his for a moment and then did something I will remember the rest of my life. He picked up his Sunday and without a word, he walked over and placed it in front of the woman. With a big smile, he told her, here, this is for you. Ice cream is good for the soul sometimes, and my soul is good already. Of all my children, he is by far the most trying, the quickest to anger, the first one to break something, and the last one to do what he's told to do. None of it matters, though, because, like he said, his soul was already good. When Jesus said he was very much, he, that he very much wanted to share this supper with his disciples, he wasn't just praying for ice cream. He was praying for them to do this in remembrance of me. So the question is, what is the this, which is what he was talking about? We usually think that it means only the supper, but the supper, the Passover meal, was a celebration of freedom from slavery, a road through the impassable sea, the defeat of an overwhelming Egyptian army, the open door to a beautiful spirit filled future. The invitation to a festival of joyful praise. These are the Old Testament foundations for this time together. But Jesus did not stop with the Old Testament promises. He fulfilled those promises in himself. He ached for his followers to realize 
that his broken body and his spilled bloody blood and his sacrifice would open the way for a true freedom, a new and wonderful friendship with God and the end of the power of evil over us. There is a thread of salvation that is borne out in the life of Jesus. The Egyptians set their calendars by the moon and the stars. The Hebrews set their calendar by the story of freedom from slavery. Now the Christians would set their calendar by the gift of a new relationship with God. The New Testament writers saw Jesus as the supreme contradiction of the old way of doing things. God had broken into time with its slavery to sin and to death. Whenever there was a victory over evil, somehow this new kairotic event was taking place. Kairos happened whenever a new believer was baptized or whenever love broke through the power of hate or whenever true peace happened. Wherever Jesus glorified was glorified in this special kind of time, burst forth, a newness took place that was unexpected and yet powerful. A young man who was studying the cello under the great master Pablo Casals remembers a practice session in which he played a very difficult piece with great precision. I knew that I had played flawlessly, he said, and I was looking for high praise from the master who had been listening very intently. Instead, I heard him say, you are playing the notes, but not the music. Sometimes we go through the motives, motions of being followers of Christ. We play the notes, but not the music. Sometimes we don't know how to respond to God, and yet he is there to lead us in the response. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he didn't mean to go through the motions of acting free or pretend to be loving or act as if you're at peace or put on some kind of a show of Christian virtue. During the remembrance of him, it means to live in the music of his grace. Have you ever watched a water bug? They're amazing creatures. They have long legs and these legs splay out and support the weight of the insect upon the surface tension of the water. I noticed some of them were playing yesterday when Nancy and I went fishing for some fish that refused to make an appearance when we wanted them to. But the bugs were there. The bugs never get wet. They skate back and forth frenetically searching for whatever it is that they're looking for. Water bugs don't live in the water, they live on it. Their world is shimmering like a glassy surface. Beneath them are the depths of which they have no awareness. In the helter skelter of our lives, we too are often like the water bugs. We race to and fro, busy with one errand or another, oblivious all the while to the deeper dimension below. We spend so much time gliding about on the surface, seldom do we plumb the depths. We need to take a deep breath and dive in. Richard Cardinal Cushing, who was Bishop of the Catholic Churches of Boston during the mid part of the 1900s, is credited with this whimsical and lighthearted approach to doing the work of the church. He said, if all the sleeping folks would wake up and all the lukewarm folks would fire up and all the dishonest folks would fess up and all the disgruntled folks would sweeten up and all the discouraged folks would cheer up and all the depressed folks would look up and all the estranged folks would make up and the gospers, gospel, I'm sorry, and all the gospers would shut up 
and all the dry bones would rise up and all the true soldiers would stand up and all the church members would pray up and the Savior for all was lifted up, then we would have a wonderful grand renewal. It is really all about doing the remembering the one who is wonderfully present to us even now. As I was thinking about this message today, it came to me that the Gospels that we have, the four Gospels and much of the work that they spun off, was because the people who were valuable to Jesus were in the upper room, perhaps learned of him later on, that they had remembered him, that is, put together again Jesus Christ, and were living up to what Jesus called them to do, to do this in remembrance of me. We would like to remind you that the offering being taken is a virtual offering in some sense. However, we would like to thank those of you who have been faithful in supporting the work of the church over these past several weeks when we haven't been able to be together in our sanctuary. We rejoice in the fact that we can be together in spirit, and we would like to thank the Bosick family for enabling us to participate together in a <clears throat> patriotic hymn, America the Beautiful, as uh, Jim and Becky and Ben are presenting it for us with their instruments. We thank them for that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Let us pray. Wonderful and gracious Lord, we thank you for your presence in our midst. And we ask, Lord, that you will guide us and fill us with the richness of your love. We pray, Lord, that you will move with power in our midst and stir us again to the brightness and the wonder of life in you. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to bear one another's burdens, lift up those who are sorrowing, carry the weight of those who are grieving. And we ask, Lord, that we might do so within the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the summoning and the work of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you will touch us and fill us with the grace and the peace that we desire. Help us, Lord, to be safe and well from the virus and help us to move forward with the grace and the peace of Christ. We pray this in his name. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of his glory, the only wise God, our Savior, the Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, to whom be the majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>